everybody, it's Ben. And this is Will. And today we have a lovely screencast for you on advanced Python topics. Definitely a screencast. We definitely did not already do this recording, and I did not say podcast, and it wasn't embarrassing. That did not just happen. We are doing a screencast. A screencast is not a podcast. Yep. Uh. And today we are going to be talking about Django. Woo! What the heck is Django, you might ask? Well, it is a handy little Python-based web framework. Uh, it allows you to quickly, quickly, quickly deploy very advanced websites and web applications using Python, which, as you know, we simply adore. Indeed. And so today we're just going to do like a little bit of an introduction. We're going to talk about installing Django. We're going to talk about what project is and what app and just do a very high level overview of getting Django on your computer so that you can get up and running and checking out uh, developing, starting web applications in Django. And then in the coming weeks, we're going to discuss things with much more detail. We're actually going to go through a little test project with you to get you intro introduced to everything that's involved. And it should be quite beautiful by the time we're done. Yep. So today we're working in OSX, and this uh, also will work in Ubuntu or a Linux distribution. Uh, and then probably in a second or two, Will's also going to show you the Windows way to do this as well. The Windows way, of course, being very similar, but we'll get to that when we get to it. Yep. So the very first thing we need to do is, you know, get all the source code. If you are using, uh, like if you have Mac ports installed or you're on a Ubuntu machine and you've got apt, you could just install from repositories, but repositories tend to drag a little bit. They're behind the current release with most Django versions. So we're actually going to be pulling from source. As you can see, Ben has already curled down the source files from the web. Uh, you could also go through a browser if you want to do it that way. And now he's just kind of unpacking and getting things ready to do the installation. Sometimes you have to use sudo. Every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty of Django is that it's basically just a Python module when it comes down to it. And so it's very, very simple to install. You just download the source code, it's all zipped, and then all you need to do is run this one little command to actually install the dang thing. Yep. Sudo set python set of .py install. And what you can see is it just installed Django onto my system. So now if I open up a Python interpreter, import Django, that works. And then I can do django.get version. And boom, there's the version of Django that we just installed. 1.3.1, which is the development version, which is the very latest version of Django. Is that not ridiculously easy, or is that not ridiculously easy? It is ridiculously easy. Now, we're going to cut, and I'll show you how to do it in Windows. Go. So for once, Windows installation is actually very, very similar to the Linux or, you know, Mac realm. Uh, quite honestly, the most difficult bit about this is getting the darn package unpacked. Uh, so Django is distributed as a zipped tarball file, and uh, the native zip unpacker decompressor in Windows won't handle that, so you need to get a little program called 7-zip. Free to download, handles all the formats, very, very nice. So I've already got my package download here. Just going to right-click 7-zip. I'm just going to extract here. And all that's going to do is unzip it, and it's going to give me this dist folder. Uh, but then I, actually, I need to actually go in there, and this is the tar file. So now I'm going to 7-zip again and extract here. And this will actually unzip everything, fully extract it, and then we'll actually be able to get going with installation. That fully extracted, I'm just going to throw this on my desktop. And then you can actually get rid of both the dist and the tar.gc file that you downloaded. Uh, you don't need those anymore, so boom, gone. Now, within Django here, uh, we just do exactly the same thing that we did in Linux. So I'm just going to get a little command window open. Now we're just going to hop onto the desktop, and then we are in Django. And now we just do the exact same thing, pretty much, as in Linux. It's just uh, setup.py, install. 
and away we go. And with that done, we're just going to go ahead and pop open the old interactive interpreter. And now we should just be able to import Django. Seems to work fine. And get version. Bam, 1.3.1, and that is it. One of the few times Windows, Linux, and OS X all kind of have the same install procedure. And we're back. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> <laughs> we weren't talking about you while you were gone. No, we weren't. No, All right, yeah. just cleaning up after myself a little bit. We have Django installed. So the very first thing to look at is this handy little app called Django Admin. .py. This is going to be the all-encompassing super app. You're going to be using this a lot. So we need to make sure that we have this in path, we know where it is, and it's just djangoadmin.py is super, super important when you are actually doing stuff with this. So this little tiny program, it's a little Python program, uh, will allow you to easily create and manage Python app or Django applications. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to run Django app admin.py and we're going to do start project to create a new site and we'll call that what should we call this site? What kind of what kind of website do we want to develop? Let's develop a cookie making. Oh, oh, we could do we could do a recipe book. Okay. So, we're going to call it recipe book. For heck. Okay. So now that creates a directory in, probably if you're going to be on Mac, you can do this in your little sites directory uh, or wherever you want to do your Django development in, you, that's where you init this thing. And uh, it'll create this little directory called recipe book. And when you look in there, you're going to see, magically see four files automatically created for you. Now, uh, something I want to clarify is that there is, for people that have never worked with Django before, this can be a little bit confusing. What we just did was make a site, like an entire site is kind of what we made here. We didn't actually create an application. Uh, so in a minute, we're actually gonna get into creating applications within our site, but there's kind of this division that I don't think people realize. Uh, you made a big site that can encompass many applications. That's what we just did. So anything we mess around at this level is going to apply to all of our applications within this site. Yeah, uh, the difference between applications and, and, and sites is is different because you can actually download and install uh, pre-made applications from the web. Uh, one big application that you could use is the uh, auth, user auth application that comes pre-installed with Django, and that allows you to have users that can log in and log out and have passwords, and you can know their email and that sort of thing. But for instance, if you have like a blog, that would be considered an app. Um, a recipe would be an app in our recipe book, so various different things. Now, one important thing to note with this project is that the Python path needs to point to this recipe book folder. And you can see because of this init.py folder in here, uh, that recipe book itself is a Python module. Whoa, crazy concept. So if we go into Python, we can do import recipe book. And it's going to say no module named recipe book because this is not in our Python path. Now, there are a number of ways to import thing uh, to set up your Python path. We might need to talk about that in a different podcast, but this needs to be in your Python path. Now, if you're just here, anything that, you know, if you do import settings, um, then that works because uh, your your current working directory is where you started up this, uh, this Python interpreter and it'll work just fine. So everything we're gonna do today will work, um, but keep in mind that Python paths are gonna be important when we actually deploy this. Very, very important. It can get a little bit frustrating if you don't have your path set up properly. Okay, so the first thing I want to show you is this settings.py fi uh, file. Uh, settings.py contains all the global settings for Django. 
And you can see there's a bunch of fun stuff in here, like uh, whether we're doing the debug version of Django or not. If debug is set to true, you'll get a very verbose output when problems uh, happen in your Django site. And that's great for development, but you don't really want your users to see that if there's a problem on your website. So if you deploy this, then you set that to false. Big red flag on that one. You do not want debug information displayed to users. Also note that this entire file is just a Python file. There's nothing real special about it, but everything you do in Python, you can do in this file if you wanted to. It's not the greatest thing to like declare functions or anything in here, but you can see that a lot of this information is just lists or dictionaries, common data types that you see in Python programs. Yep. Um, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but for instance, uh, just some of the ones I want to point out here, uh, admins, you can set up tuples of, you know, your name with your email address that will, Python will send you emails if something goes wrong. Uh, databases, that's how you set up your databases. Note that you can use Postgres, MySQL, SQLite, Oracle uh, in there. So you set up your uh, database account there. Time zone, I just changed it to New York, even though Will's in Chicago time zone. Language. Um, and then there's a bunch of other stuff in here that we'll probably talk about later when we actually get into it. But this is the main place where you control your entire Django website. I'm just going to go on a little tangent. Django actually has fantastic support for multiple languages, and it actually makes it really easy to build an application and then automatically translate it to a different language. Uh, it, it's actually really cool and powerful. So if you need internationalization, Django, Django is a great great option for that. The next little module that we're gonna talk about is this urls.py. This is the entry point for every website is you have to say, oh, you're going to this URL, I will do something for that URL. Uh, for instance, an index uh, page or something like that. Uh, URL patterns lets you define those URLs and give Django, or tell Django what to do to handle a user when it tries requests that URL. There's nothing in here right now. We'll talk about that in more detail later, too. And if you remember last week's regex thing, yeah, a lot of that's going to look pretty familiar once we start talking about URLs. Oh, yes. Good tip. The last thing in here is this .manage .py. This is essentially a shortcut for the Django admin .py. It's the same kind of module. Um, and so if you notice, I made it executable. You can either do that or you can just type in python manage.py every time. And then you give it commands on the command line and it allows you to work with your Django application from the command line. And so you can see all the commands that are available, including things like change password. Here you go, sync db. That's another important one. Dump data. That's also an important one that I use a lot. Uh, so this allows you to work with your Django app. And also what it allows you to do is go into your Django environment. So this shell. Uh, this loads up the entire Django environment. So if you do import django.conf, I think, and then you can get that entire settings file uh, from the settings object here. So by doing that dot manage py shell, then you can work with your Django environment. Which is really pretty cool. And this manage.py application is super powerful because it, it's kind of the bridge between what you code and then setting things up and actually working with the database directly. So this will actually, uh, when we get to it, it'll be able to actually pull stuff from the database, build code, take code, build the database, go back and forth between the two. It's a really good intermediary between what you program and all the stuff that makes your site and applications actually run. That's a very good description. Anyway, I've just used it to start a new application within our project uh, called Recipe. And just like start project, uh, start app created a directory in our Django project called Recipe and then put in uh, four files again, four slightly different files. And now this is actually a folder within our site. So the, the actual tree view of this would be um, our recipe book folder. And then within that, we would have our recipe folder with all these files. We could, in theory, add another app. We could add a blog called Blog. We could add a, uh, I don't know, a fitness tracking app called Fitness or Big Manly Men if we wanted to. And, you know, there would be these different folders within our recipe book site. So apps within a site is how you need to look at it. Right. So the first thing that I looked at is this very empty views.py. 
there's nothing here, but you're gonna create your views here. And views in, in the model view controller model allow you to tell Django what to do when someone requests a site. So sometimes this is give back a web page. Sometimes this is work with the database and then give back a web page. Sometimes this is give back JSON data uh, for Ajax or XML data if you're doing an XML site. Uh, so you would write all that code for your recipe app in this file. We should maybe talk a little bit about the model view controller architecture. People might not be familiar with this, but model view controller, MVC, is this entire architecture and way of setting up projects that really, really focuses on breaking data away from presentation, uh, away from the logic of everything. So in our case, models are actually going to turn out to be Python classes and objects, essentially. And that's where you kind of define how data is structured. So our recipes, we might have ingredients as a thing within our recipe object. We might have instructions as a thing within it. We might have a prep time uh, property within our recipe model. And so this model kind of structures and defines how data is related. Then you got your uh, view options, which is actually, hey, how are we going to present this data? Are we going to spit out a web page? Are we going to return just some JSON data? What are we going to do with it? And then the controller kind of ties everything together and makes it work, I guess you could say. Yes, that's all good. In Django, the controller is that URLs.py. Um, so, it, you know, if you're used to the MVC model, that's URLs.py. So the first thing is you request something from the controller. The controller then decides based on your request what view to do to give uh, give back to you. And then the view decides on how to interact with the model, uh, the underlying model to give you the data that you're requesting. It's really a cool way to design things and it really, it gives you a nice, well-structured way of programming. Yep. Speaking of models, I'm in the models.py folder, and this is where you essentially des design what goes in and out of your database. And so just as an example, I've put recipe and ingredient as two database tables that we would define in our models. But we will talk about this a lot more uh, in the future. In future episodes, screencasts coming up. <laughs> in the future. In the future. Yeah, the basic gist is uh, the, the models you define are going to be direct representations of what's in the database. And I don't know if Ben is going to show us this, but once you define models, you can actually use that manage.py application to create everything in your database. Right. So I haven't actually connected anything to a database yet, so we might have to save that for a different screencast. As you can see, there's a lot going on with this. We're trying to present it in an orderly fashion without overwhelming you but we might get ahead of ourselves. And by we, I mean me. <laughs> uh, and the last thing is, uh, is this test.py. Uh, Django tries to enforce test-driven development, and so for every app, you can create test cases. Uh, for instance, there's this simple test case here that we test addition, uh, but more likely you'll test to make sure your views are returning correct things, that your models are going into the database or are validating correctly, that your forms are uh, you know, doing the right thing when you're posting data or when you're getting data from the website. So I highly encourage you not to ignore these uh, test files. Uh, some Django developers do. But if you want, every time you make a change, if you want to keep sane and you uh, have tests that test the, da uh, the database and, and your app in general, uh, then you will become a much de better developer and things won't break as often. That's good, right? That is absolutely good. And the way that you run those tests is you do this dot .manage uh, py test and ooh, looks like Django has already reported to me, hey, you need a database. <laughs> in order to be uh, a good Django website. So you can see that testing has already served us well. <laughs> I, I think we might have known that, though. Yes, we did know that. But in general, your tests and testing is a good thing to ensure that you know once you make changes, you don't mess everything up. We're going to jump around a little bit here. Normally, you would sit down and actually get an application somewhat built up. You'd have your models defined. You'd do something with your URLs that you're going to be handling. Uh, we're going to skip all that for now and kind of jump ahead to how do we actually see the output on the web? 
Yes, it looks like it's going to force me to do a database. Okay, I'll talk about the databases a little bit while Ben's doing this. Uh, Django is really nice and it allows you to use a ton of different databases and it, there are a bunch of built-in types, specifically MySQL, uh, Postgres, and then also SQLite. Uh, obviously, if you don't have a MySQL database running, SQLite is a great way to just do it locally. Uh, if you don't know what SQLite is, go look into it. It's nice for kind of localized development. But uh, you can also get other modules for different databases. I think Oracle's a built-in option too, isn't it? Yes, Oracle is an option. And then there are, for other databases, you can find uh, controllers. What, what you're really looking for is some sort of Python module that interacts with the database. So it's really nice. Django gives you tons of options on what database you're using and then just abstracts all the interactions for you. It's just super, super handy. Okay. I don't know if you noticed, but while Will was talking, I created the database, a SQLite database in this case, and I synced it. Now I'm in SQLite and I can show you in our database all of those tables has been created for our Django app. When you sync your app and your database with manage.py, it essentially says, it, it looks at your models, it looks at your database, if there are any incongruities between the two, it rectifies them either by uh, removing stuff from your database or adding stuff to your database. Yep, and SQLite database got stuck right there in my local directory, um, just so you can see that. So now we're gonna run a little bit of a test server here, right? And uh, so this test server is um, part of Django and it runs a very lightweight, not only for development, not for production test server that will allow you to develop in a rapid fashion without having to connect your Django application to a live web server and you can just test it on your, on your computer without having to install Apache or anything like that. So when you run test server, you can see it gives you this little URL to go to. And then if we open up a browser, New window and we type in that URL you will see congratulations it works your first Django powered page woo yay so we have created a website albeit one that doesn't do much but it looks nice it's got blue and some yellow and honestly that's all I want in a website indeed you can even see on the console the get request uh, that I got the uh, the web page the index page so uh, in, another, in another screencast, uh, we will definitely show you how to connect Django to Apache and to do a production web server. Uh, that's a little bit more complicated, but as of now, you should have enough information to start up your own Django application and create your own project and your own applications and develop using the test server and, and, and start running away with uh, Django web development. So where we'll go from here, we'll probably, our, in our next screencast, we're going to work a little bit more on the actual application, get that up and running, using our test server to run everything. And uh, then we're going to do another screencast, so we'll probably actually address how on earth do you turn this into a production server using Apache. And yeah, that's, that's going to be an interesting one. There are a lot of options when it comes to getting a production server going. Yes, there are a lot of options, and it tends to be a little bit complicated, but we can do it. Yeah, it probably won't be a five skull. No, it won't. Maybe a four skull. <laughs> so yeah, that's your introduction to Django. Um, hope you enjoyed it. I mean, obviously there are a lot of great resources online. Uh, the Django site actually has a fantastic book that kind of walks through everything to get you going. Uh, lots and lots of information. Very, very nice. We'll probably include the links either in the post or on the video, probably both. But, you know, uh, still, it's nice to see it sometimes. Yep. As always, you can follow us on Twitter. You can follow me at twitter.com slash bbankfort. You can follow Will at, at Will2041. And you can follow the show at, at The Zipline Show. We're also on Facebook, facebook.com slash The Zipline Show. Definitely like us on Facebook. Then you get notifications of everything we do because we make a point to cross post onto Facebook. There's the Facebook page. Uh, this screencast is on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash zipline show with no the. And then if you're ever in doubt, in doubt, just go to the zipline show.com. We got links to all the major social media. You can hear all the old podcasts there, uh, links to iTunes. Yeah, that's the one. That's, uh, that's the central hub of everything. So zipline show.com. Indeed. So go out there and hack Django. <laughs>